thank you for having me here today. And perhaps as I often speak on immigration policy, I say immigration policy, I say it's foolish to assume that everybody here agrees with me, but of course we're all imperfect, particularly myself. We do have shared goals. Let me share some of those with you for today. These include a rational, humane, and just immigration policy. I don't think anybody here disagrees with that. It becomes one of how we achieve these results. And so today, I'm here to address public policy through public safety and law enforcement, particularly a perspective on law enforcement and how cost savings can be achieved by implementing immigration reform. One of the things that I'd like you to think about is whether we in this policy that we don't have or want to have, we look at the part or we look at the whole and how we define the public good. I believe that the highest priority of any law enforcement agency is to protect the community it serves. With respect to enforcing our immigration laws, the Department of Homeland Security through the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency achieves their mission in cooperation with state and local governments. Now that came from the Illegal Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1996. In Harris County, we are the only urban jurisdiction in Texas that runs a 287G program. What is a 287G program? It's one that allows a state and local law enforcement entity to enter into a partnership with ICE, the Immigration Customs um, Enforcement <coughs> Agency, under a joint memorandum of agreement. The state or local entity receives delegated authority for immigration enforcement strictly within those jurisdictions. Under a signed MOA, the Memorandum of Agreement between the Department of Homeland Security and our Sheriff Adrian Garcia, we have trained and certified employees of the Sheriff's Office who work side by side with those ICE officers only in the Harris County Jail. And they identify illegal immigrants. All 254 Texas counties in addition to an array of municipalities, including the city of Houston, also use the Secure Communities Database. What is the Secure Communities Database? It is another ICE program in partnership with federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies that identify criminal aliens as they are defined by law through modernized information sharing. They prioritize enforcement actions to ensure apprehension and removal of dangerous criminal aliens and transforms the enforcement process and systems to achieve certain results. In 2009, our very own Harris County budget and auditing staff determined that the annual cost of implementing both the 287G and the Secure Communities Program was an estimated $1.1 million. No nine, those figures took into account salaries for personnel. We can assume that there's been some modest increase. Keep in mind that for the Harris County Sheriff's Office, the annual budget for 2011-2012 is $392.5 million. Almost all of those costs are attributed to payroll for deputies and detention officers who otherwise would not be serving the functions. That's the one point one. million. The cost of housing inmates merely because they are being held for immigration enforcement purposes or examination is really non-existent in the sense that ICE works with our county jail on a day-to-day -day basis. When we ask ourselves what a change in policy could bring, you could see an effective result in the administration of these two programs. Such a result would be contingent on whether ICE would actually continue a partnership with a local law enforcement agency and whether that agency would also administer the program. So if you terminate both of those programs, you could have a reallocation of those resources. There's another program. The state, uh, excuse me, the state Criminal Alien Assistance Program, otherwise known as SCAP. It is one that the United States Congress authorizes and appropriates funding for. It is a formula grant program that provides financial assistance to states and localities for correctional officer salaries incurred for incarcerating undocumented criminal aliens, as defined by law. In 2011, Harris County received, just shortly, about eight weeks ago, 2.387 million in grant funding from this program. So while you administer the 287G or Secure Communities Program as 
as they are. They are not a qualifying prerequisite for this particular grant funding. If you change public policy, this program could perhaps change as well at the federal level, but you cannot guarantee that the funds would be there because Congress is the appropriator. With respect to state legislation, here's a policy solution I'd like for our audience to think about. A change that allows and encourages immigrants lacking legal status to obtain a driver privilege card, auto insurance, vehicle registration, could improve safety, raise government revenue, and allow law enforcement to efficiently and properly identify drivers. Said policy may also reduce the prevalence of having an undocumented traffic violator flee the scene of an accident, given their fear of possible deportation, and as a result, enhance safety for drivers, pedestrians, and law enforcement personnel. Studies, particularly out of the state of Utah, have shown this is a cost of savings to the taxpayer. I began by talking about the priority of law enforcement. I leave you with this. If the highest priority of law enforcement is truly the protection of all residents in a community it serves, then one must also consider the reluctance of local residents with questionable legal status to identify themselves as crime victims or crime witnesses. These individuals live in fear of deportation and crime is neither prevented nor solved under these conditions. That is a cost to us in real dollars. As a result, the job of maintaining public order really remains inhuman and unjust for the undocumented community, and at the very least, remains a blemish of morality for all. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dave Lopez, and I'm the president and CEO of the Harris County Hospital District. And I was told I had about four hours, but I guess I only had a couple of minutes. <laughs> I'll tell you in advance, and I have to warn you, my father was a minister. So I'm not going to preach, but uh, I love having audiences, because really and truly, I see healthcare as a, as a major issue in our community. Um, I don't have answers in terms of what, the, uh, what, what we have to do going forward, but I will tell you that what we're doing today is not acceptable. It's not status quo, it's not reasonable, it's not appropriate, um, and it is... Uh, so we're going to have to address. And let me say at the outset that uh, we'll be the district, myself personally, and our staff, uh, we believe in immigration reform. That's something we're going to have to address. That's a two-hour discussion, I'm not going to get into that. But I would say this. When individuals are here in our community, it's not an immigration issue, it's a health care issue. There are people who live amongst us who have needs that are great, that we have to address. Um, you know, what we try to do with the hospital district, uh, we have one pretty good rule of thumb that we utilize in terms of providing care to the undocumented. One, uh, here's what we do and ask ourselves. If your reads bad and you some chronic, we don't do it. If your reads okay, then we do it. Uh, what does that mean? We're not doing tummy tucks, facelifts, or no shops. We're taking care of basic issues in our community that have to be addressed. Uh, on a serious note, I will tell you that we deal with this issue each and every day. We had a young lady show up in our emergency room at Bent a 23-year-old lady, um, undocumented, we cook at a restaurant here in town. I will tell you what a restaurant, you've probably been there. She showed up and had typhus. You cannot put her back on the street without taking care of that. You have to address that as a matter of good public policy. So that, in that particular case, yes, we take care of that individual. That is better for our community for us to do that than to have an outbreak of typhus. So we address that. Uh, another example, we had a young lady show up who was 21 years old, was pregnant, um, and had blood pressure of 220 over 130. Now, that is a walking stroke. We have three options. One, tell her that she's not covered, <clears throat> put her back on the street. She may stroke out and die, it's no longer a problem. Option B, um, put her on a prenatal program, $500 probably for the term of her pregnancy, and if not, she may go out, uh, carry the baby term, we will spend half a million dollars on that baby in, in seven months, 
or she'll stroke out and be in the ICU for an extended period of time. And so obviously, uh, the answer is put on a prenatal program. So we'd rather spend $500 and spend half a million or more on a very ill child or a patient that has uh, great needs. And so from our perspective, this is an area we're going to have to address folks. And there's a lot of ref talk about reform in our, in our, in our country. You know what, there's a lot of good ideas being put forward with health reform. However, uh, one of the things that concerns me is that the reform bill basically exempts the undocumented from buying into what are going to be called purchasing combines where you can spread the risk. I don't understand something. We allow them to buy auto insurance. We allow them to buy home insurance. But why is it that we do not allow them in the current bill to acquire um, health insurance? What's the difference? I think it's getting caught up in political uh, issues regarding immigration reform. So we're going to have to address that, folks. It is not something that we can look the other way about. I will tell you that, uh, from our perspective, it is an area that we watch very carefully. Uh, but um, in our system, for example, um, our annual budget uh, is roughly 1.1, 1.2 billion per year. If I look at my total cost of the document, uh, where roughly we had about 64,000 individuals seek care in our facilities um, during the last year. Those 64,000 individuals accounted for about 451,000 encounters. The vast majority of those being on the outpatient side, some inpatient. However, inpatient costs are very expensive. You know, the average charge today for an inpatient setting is 2,500 to 3,000 per day. An outpatient visit is roughly $100. Uh, but the vast majority of these individuals got care in our clinic system where we avoid um, more expensive acute care. But those 64,000 individuals, uh, again, accounted for 451,000 encounters as inpatient and outpatient. Now, on a budget of 1.1 or 1.2 billion per year, the total cost that we incurred uh, for those individuals was about 198 million. They did pay, many individuals are paying on their bills. They pay about 35 million uh, in, 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 I guess, in payments. So we received 35 million uh, in payments. That basically meant that the annual expense that we incurred after the payment was about 162 million. You know what? That is, uh, it's only about 13, 14 percent of our budget, but it is growing every year. It is growing every year. It's growing by one, two, maybe three percentage points every year. But we're going to have to address that. Um, what we're trying to do in our community is let people know that don't wait until you get so ill and you have to come see us. Many of the undocumented uh, do not seek health care for fear that they're going to report to the INS. If we're not part of the INS, we don't want to share data with the INS, we don't do that. And here's the startling fact that we've also found out about our undocumented population. One, they're usually younger than the population who live here. They're probably in better health. Many of the men who come over here are not coming here to get health care. They're coming here to work. So the one, the men that we see in our emergency room and our clinics are people who had an accident or people who had some other issues that need to be addressed on an emergency basis. But let me say this, the vast majority, the vast majority of our volume in our system is women and children. Eighty percent of my undocumented volume are women and children. You know, we asked uh, we asked one of the uh, one of our patients. You know, why do you bring your families, um, you know, to here to this country whenever you're here to work? One individual, and again, this may not be based on empirical data, but just talking to one individual, uh, he said that you know I, I did try to come across legally. I filled out my paperwork. I got it all in. I told my family we're not going to go across. Uh, to be that great country, legally we're going to do it the right way. And he told us in one of her accounts, she said, you know, um, I turned in my paperwork and I was so proud to have turned it in, but then when I was given an appointment for my hearing, it was 17 years from the day that I turned it in. 
He said, what am I going to tell my family? I'll see you in 17 years. So he said, about my family. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with that logic. What I'm saying is that, folks, we have an issue we need to address. But ultimately, uh, many of our patients uh, have a dire need for health care. Whatever we can do to see them in, a, in an environment where um, they can get health care and not fear that they're going to be reported uh, is very important to us. Again, we can either take care of them for $100 on an outpatient basis, or we can get so ill that they're admitted to an institution where we will spend $25,000, $3,000 per day. So for us, I think we, we need to look at this from a broader perspective. We will continue to care for those individuals in our community that need health care. Now, when the hospital district legislation was enacted back in the 60s, there were two criteria that one needed to um, have, I guess, you know, to qualify for care within our system. One, you have to decide in the county. And two, you have to show proof of income. So ultimately, there's no requirement in our legislation, uh, in our enabling legislation, to determine whether or not you are here legally or not. Uh, and some attorneys have said that if you impose a, a third standard, which is citizenship, you're, you're going beyond what the law has enacted. I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to get into that, but we, I will tell you this. Uh, we will continue to see individuals who need health care on a good public policy perspective. Just to reiterate, we're not doing anything uh, that we would be embarrassed about. But we are doing the kind of things that our community needs, that you would expect us as stakeholders to do the right thing for the people that are here in our community living amongst us. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sons and daughters of immigrants. <laughs> Grandsons and granddaughters of immigrants. Great, great grandsons and daughters of immigrants. We are an immigrant nation, but we forget that. And each wave of immigrants that comes seems to forget it a little bit more. Let us recall them and let us do something about it. St. Francis of Assisi, a deacon by the way, said, preach the gospel always. Sometimes use words. Sometimes use words. In other words, action speaks louder than words. Action. There is a community of caring in Houston, in this county, where action marks its approach and attitude towards the undocumented. We didn't say legal the undocumented community of Houston and Harris County and beyond. It is a faith-based community, it is a nonprofit community, it is a volunteer community, and it gives unselflessly of itself to those hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children who are here but hidden in the recesses of their undocumentation. Some are powerful advocates, like Maria Jimenez, who is here, or Stan Merrick, who is here. Powerful, powerful advocates. Others, like Paul, if you can tell, is a powerful provider of medical services to the undocumented community to the extent that he can. And his board supports that. And we should be grateful for but again, across this community, other boards, other exempts, other community organizers, other workers who are providing services that the state and federal government refuse to provide to an element that is working very hard to provide services, to provide streets, to provide houses, to provide all manner of accommodations and services that you and I need. It's a caring community. It's a caring community. We are just one of many. We share this with many other agencies who work collaboratively 
it does come at a cost. We would do it anyway, but it does come at a cost. Why? Back in the 1900s, the U.S. Census reported how many recent immigrants were on the public dole. The city of Philadelphia numbered 45,000 were on the public dole. That is no longer the case across this country. The immigrants no longer the undocumented. They do not qualify for Medicare, for Medicaid, except in a rare exception, temporary assistance for needy families, children's health insurance program with an exception, food stamps, supplemental security, or public housing assistance. All the basic needs that a community needs to support low income and vulnerable populations. <coughs> So who picks up? Who does it? Well, the federal and state governments to some extent still carry on. For example, the Texas Emergency Medicaid is Emergency Medicaid like it reads. And that's available for extreme situations, but also childhood. The Texas Family Violence Program protects the woman who is abused. The Texas Children's Health Insurance Program does provide perinatal coverage during the pregnancy and that first year of life, the perinatal stage. And there are a few other limited programs. So who picks it up? It's the faith community, the nonprofit community, the volunteer community. There is a cost to the state of Texas for these various programs. The state emergency Medicaid expends up to 62 or more million dollars a year. The family violence program is much more modest, 1.3 million dollars. The perinatal program, a part of CHIP, is about 33 or more million dollars per year. In Catholic charities, we consistently spend about 1.6 million dollars through our St. Francis Cabrini Legal Immigration Clinic. This wonderful director, Wafa Abdi, is up here. He consists of outreach every year. In this past year, there are over 13,000 undocumented persons learned what their status was by attending what we call CHILDS. It costs money. It costs money to, to hold a child. It costs money to put uh, uh, immigration lawyers and their assistants to dedicate a day to working with these clients, to vetting them, to telling some this law is so broken there's nothing we can do for you. Or to say, ah, even though it's as complicated a code as the IRS almost, we have found a niche. We have found a little place where we think we've got a case. It goes on. But these people are also hungry. These people are also homeless sometimes. These people need the basic necessities. And so there are other programs to feed them, to house them whenever we can, to care for that woman who has been beaten and her children. Those are costs. Those are costs. There are other costs. There are costs. When you get the angry phone call from one who says, I will never give the Catholic Charities again, never, 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 because you deal with those illegals. There's the ugly letters, the telephone calls. There's also the foundations that say, no, we can't give to you. You deal with those illegal immigrants. Yes, there are costs. The political model is not working to resolve this. The faith community, agencies that are a nonprofit nature, volunteers will continue to serve, but we need relief. We need your assistance. Archbishop Fiorenza, the Archbishop Emeritus of Galveston, Houston, Archdiocese, once came into a room that was trying to raise some capital funds. And he said, 
I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is we have the money. And so a voice, maybe it was Stan Merrick's voice, said, well, how could it possibly be bad news? And I Bishop replied, it's still in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> we have the solutions. We know how to craft the laws and the public policies that will lead these hardworking, dedicated, selfless people who left the land because they couldn't feed their families. We know how to create a path to legalization, but it's still in our pockets. Action speaks louder than words.